Amen. Thank you for that, ladies. What a blessing the music has been. It's been a joy for my wife and I to be here today. Appreciate you all coming back tonight. Those of you that heard me and came back anyway, I'm excited about that. <clears throat> this is the Thanksgiving season, and so obviously we've been counting our blessings. I think it's probably appropriate if we're thankful every day. I read a verse that said, in everything give thanks, and yet uh, sometimes because God has blessed us so abundantly and uh, we have so much, I, I think sometimes we're spoiled. We just kind of take it for granted, but I have some great news for you. We serve a wonderful God who wants to bless us. In fact, I want to preach tonight on a passage that guarantees the blessings of God. Now, it's a conditional passage. You know, most of the promises in the Bible are conditional. For instance, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. There's a condition. I had this illustrated several years ago. I was in my office, and uh, the phone rang. Nobody else was there. And uh, uh, I answered, and the lady uh, almost hysterically said, is, is, is this the pastor? Uh, yes, ma'am. Can I help you? She goes, I, I don't have time to talk, but, but, but call this phone number. And she gave me a phone number. I said, excuse me? She goes, just call the number. Well, I almost always do what crazy ladies ask me to do. <laughs> So I dialed the number, and uh, the guy answered, this is such and such a radio station. I said, yeah, my uh, name is Hal Hightower. And he goes, congratulations, you've just won $1,000. They were having a contest. And uh, I guess if they read your name over the radio and you respond in the allotted amount of time, you're the winner. And so this lady in our town who evidently has no life at all, <laughs> recognized my name and wanted me to get the prize, so she called me. And so the guy says, you've won $1,000. I was so excited. I mean, I, I, I've never won anything. I'm the guy that gets Cracker Jacks and there's no prize, right? <laughs> and so uh, he says, all right, I need to get your information. Uh, so I, I said, uh, okay, this is where I live, blah, blah, blah. He goes, all right, you have 30 days to come down to the station and claim your prize. He said, you need to bring a photo ID, and you need to bring the card that we mailed you. So what card? Well, this is a brand new radio station. We saturated the listening area with cards announcing the opening of our station and the contest and the rules of the contest were on the card. And they explicitly said that in order to get your prize, you have to have the card. I said, well, what kind of radio station is this? He said, we play hard rock, heavy metal. And I'm thinking, great. If I got a card from a radio station like that, I'm fairly certain what I did, right? <laughs> and so I explained it to him. I said, I might have lost it. And he said, well, I can't give it to you if you don't find it. I said, can you send me another one? No. C can you tell me somebody who got one? <laughs> no. <laughs> he said, but you have 30 days in case you find it. Well, you figured it out by now. Long story short, I didn't get it. Let me testify, I hate rock music. I was against it before, but I'm really against it now. But uh, it, it was a, a conditional situation. If you have the card, then you get the money, all right? So there's a condition in our passage. Asa is the king of Judah. If you recall your Bible history, under David and Solomon, and for the first part of Rehoboam's reign, Israel was all one nation, but under Rehoboam it split. The northern kingdom kept the name Israel. The southern kingdom took the name Judah because it was the largest of the tribes in the south. And Israel stopped serving God, never did serve God after the split. And Judah uh, did right for a little while. The king of Judah is a man named Asa. Asa is a good man. He loves God. He makes a lot of wise decisions. The king of Israel is a man named Basha. 
Basha was basically worthless. He didn't care about God. He didn't care about his people. He was all that he cared about was expanding his power. And so Basha put a blockade on the border so that nobody could go from Judah to Israel and nobody could go from Israel to Judah. Well, Asa comes up with an idea. He says, if I can get the king of Syria to go to war with Basha, then he'll be defeated and we can open up the borders. And so he bribes the king of of Syria, a man named Ben-Hadad, to go to war, and long story short, it works. But the man of God comes to him and says, you messed up. He said, you don't need to trust the enemy, you need to trust God. Let's stand, please, and we'll read the story. I'm in 2 Chronicles chapter 16. 2 Chronicles chapter 16 And I'll begin reading in the very first verse. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 1. In the sixth and thirtieth year of the reign of Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah to the intent that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord, and of the king's house, and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There's a league between me and thee, as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go, break thy leave with Basha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. And Ben-Hadad hearkened unto king Asa, and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel, and they smote Ijon, Dan, Abel, Maim, and all the store cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass, when Basha heard it, that he left off building of Ramah and let his work cease. Then Asa, king, Asa the king took all Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof, wherewith Basha was building, and he built therewith Geba and Mizpah. And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge huge host, with very many chariots and horsemen, yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. I now verse 9, this is my text, and here's where we have the conditional promise. He says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Father, bless the preaching tonight. I pray it be a help. God, we certainly want your blessings. I pray that we might live such lives that we uh, put ourselves under that fountain of goodness that you desire to show yourself strong. Bless the preaching. Bless the invitation we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, please. Asa forged an alliance with a wicked man. They had been enemies for generation, and yet because he thought it might do him good, he uh, bribed, as it were, the king of Syria to defeat his other enemy. It's the old end justifies the means mentality. Uh, It's very simple. If it's not right, it's not right. Let me say that again because uh, that's, that's pretty profound. And a lot of times uh, God's people will say amen, uh, profound statements. And uh, what I've noticed is the more amens I get, the shorter my sermons are. <laughs> All right, so, so let me try that again. If, if it's not right, it's not right. Amen. Yeah, that's good. Man, you all learn fast. <laughs> Spiritual group here. But, but so he did wrong, 
hoping that it would turn out right. Well, the result was good, but the man of God said, you've been foolish. You've done wrong. He said, don't you understand that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth? That is, God is looking, and God is searching, and God is desiring to find them whose heart is perfect toward him that God might show himself strong. Basically, he's saying this, God wants everybody to know that he's God, and he wants to show them through the person whose heart is perfect. Basha, or I'm sorry, Asa, your heart has not been perfect. God wants to show himself strong. He wants to demonstrate his power. He wants to demonstrate his goodness. He wants to remind everybody that he is God. And so the scripture tells us that his eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth. God is looking everywhere, not for people who have great abilities, not for people who are talented, not for people who might have accumulated wealth. God is looking for those whose heart is perfect toward him. Now, I understand none of us, uh, in the technical sense of the word, are perfect. It doesn't mean without flaw. It means somebody who is mature spiritually, somebody who is trying to do right, somebody whose goals and purpose and vision is to serve God and to please God. And God says, if their heart is perfect, what does that entail? Well, you have to be saved. The Bible teaches us that naturally our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But when you get saved, you're a new creature in Christ. When a person gets saved, the scripture tells us that God gives us a new heart. And so there's, there's uh, the first step is you have to be saved. But I know lots of saved people who I wouldn't say have a heart that's perfect toward God. So there's more to that. There's, there's that surrender, that willingness to say, Lord, here am I, send me. God, what is it that you would have me to do? And then there's that submissiveness that allows us to obey God, that servant's heart where we do something not just because it's required, but, but out of a heart of love. Uh, how, how many of you, when you were in school, ever had to give a book report, oral book report? Yeah, those are the worst days in the history of school. Book report day. The teacher would say, all right, who wants to go first? And some girl who actually read the book would raise her hand. <laughs> I'll go. And she gives her report. And then the teacher says, who's next? Now, you sit quiet. You don't make eye contact. You don't flinch. And you don't breathe. And if you can make it through the entire class period without being called on, it's victory. <laughs> but if indeed you do get called on, then you have to go into the, I read the book and loved it mode. Here's the report. It's a fake. At least that was the case with some people I knew. You know, oftentimes Christianity is like that. We, we, we need some volunteers for this particular thing. Who, who can help? Can you help us, brother? Oh, sure, I'd be glad to. Yeah, of course. No, a perfect heart serves out of gladness and serves out of joy and serves willingly. And then there's that faithfulness that just requires you to stay right with the Lord and the, to stay with it. You know, I've seen lots of Christians who will get on fire for the Lord, maybe at a revival meeting or maybe young people at camp or maybe because of a, a special emphasis. And boy, they're gung-ho for a while and then it just kind of fizzles out like a roller coaster up and down and up and down. Uh, the Bible says that God's looking for somebody whose heart is perfect toward him, that he might show himself strong. Let me give you some examples. 
Uh, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 6 that God looked upon the world. He saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The world was consumed with wickedness. It grieved God and he said, I'm going to destroy the world. But as he looked at mankind, he found one whose heart was perfect toward him. His name was Noah. In, in Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says, And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so God gave to Noah a plan. He said, I want you to build an ark. And for 120 years, Noah was a testimony of righteousness as he built that ark. And when the day came and God sent those animals two by two into the ark, as the neighbors and the people in the area saw this, they mocked and laughed at Noah, ridiculing Noah and ridiculing his God. And then the door on the ark closed and the skies darkened and the thunder and the lightning began to take place. The fountains of the great deep broke up and all of a sudden these scoffers, all of a sudden these rebels, all of a sudden these group of ridiculers recognized there is a God in heaven. And now I can hear them pounding on that ark. Let us in, let us in because now they knew that God was God. Listen, God wants everyone to know that he's God. And he used Noah to show that world that he was. Children of Israel had been in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. And they cried out uh, in their bitterness and their anguish, God, please send us a deliverer. And God searched. And he found a man named Moses. The Bible tells us about the character and the goodness and the meekness of Moses. Moses was a man whose heart was perfect toward God. And God said, I want to use you. He said, Moses, I want you to go into Pharaoh and tell him, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. In Exodus 5, <laughs> Pharaoh scoffs and says, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And Moses said, just hang on, you'll find out. And you know the story, God sent ten plagues. He sent, he sent uh, the, all the waters in the land of Egypt turned to blood. Can you imagine how gross that would be? Think of this, if all the water you use today was blood, when you brushed your teeth, when you took your shower, if you're old like my wife and me and you had oatmeal. Nasty. Pharaoh said, doesn't matter. I'll eat my oatmeal dry. I'm not going to obey God. And so he sent, secondly, a plague of frogs. I hope when we get to heaven there's instant replay. I want to see this one. The land is covered in frogs. I have an idea that they probably came at night. Here's the picture in my mind. Pharaoh's asleep. He wakes up in the middle of the night. It's dark. They don't have lights. They have candles. And he has to use the bathroom. So he throws the covers off, steps out of bed, and goes... <laughs> and I've never stepped on a frog, but I can imagine what it must feel like. Like a cross between a jelly donut and tapioca pudding. <laughs> and he's thinking, what is this? <laughs> well, something's got to happen. And so he goes to where the candle is. <laughs> he lights a candle. If you pardon me for this, I've been working on it all afternoon. The place was hopping with frogs. <laughs> it was horrible, but Pharaoh said, I'm not letting them go. And plague 
after plague after plague after plague until the 10th plague, every child who was the oldest in the family in the land of Egypt died unless they had put the blood on the doorpost and Pharaoh's own child perished. And he said, that's it, get out of here. And Moses and the children of Israel spoiled the Egyptians and made their way out of the land of Egypt when they came to the banks of the Red Sea. By now, Pharaoh, his heart uh, overburdened with grief and sorrow and bitterness says, I am going to get revenge. He gathers his army and he charges hard after Pharaoh. They're at the banks of the Red Sea. There's, it's way too wide to try to swim, too deep to wade. They can't go around. Pharaoh's coming behind them and, and Moses said, Lord, what should we do? God said, you don't mind if I show myself strong, do you? He said, just hold out your rod. Moses held out his rod, and the waters of the Red Sea parted. By the way, that's a fairly significant miracle. A lot of times God's people, amen, big stuff like that. Let me try that. The waters of the Red Sea parted. Amen. Yeah. A wall of water here, a wall of water here, and a two million people walk through on dry land. Little boys walking up to the water going. Mama says, come on, quit playing in that water. We got to go. And, and they're making their way. And Pharaoh and his army comes riding up. Whoa. And his counselors, his leadership said, we told you, their God is too powerful. But Pharaoh was so eaten up with bitterness, he said, we're going after them. And his chariot started through that, that little passageway made up by two walls of water, and God caused the wheels to fall off of the chariots. And when Israel was safe, God said, that's enough. And the waters of the Red Sea came crashing down, and all those in Egypt knew that the Lord was God. He showed himself strong through Moses. Can I say something? God doesn't love Moses any more than he loves you. God doesn't love Noah any more than he loves you. God is looking for somebody who's sold out. God is looking for somebody who's serious in order that he might show everybody that he's God. I love the story of Elijah. I don't know why, but in my mind, Elijah looks exactly like Lester Roloff. Amen. Elijah comes to Ahab, and he said, because of your wickedness, it's not going to rain. And Ahab said, I don't believe you. I don't care what you say. And so for three and a half years, it didn't rain. There was no water in the streams. There was no water in the ponds. There was no water for the crops. The crops dried up. The animals died. The people were in misery. And God said, all right, go tell him it's going to rain. And so Elijah goes to Ahab. And Ahab said, you're the one that caused all this problem. And Elijah said, it's not me. It's you, it's your sin, it's your worship of Baal, it's your ungodliness. He said, in fact, it's about time that everybody knew who the Lord really is. He said, let's have a contest. Let's go up on Mount Carmel, you get your prophets of Baal, and uh, we'll give them a sacrifice, and, and I'll make an altar to the Lord God, and I'll have a sacrifice, and, and, and we'll just ask uh, them and me, we'll pray, and the God that answers by fire, everybody will know he's God. Ahab says, that sounds like a great idea. So they schedule the day up on Mount Carmel. You have 750 prophets of Baal. Elijah said, all right, give them an altar. I'll get an altar. Give them some wood. I'll get some wood. Give them a sacrifice. I'll have a sacrifice. And then we'll pray, and the God that sends fire down and burns that sacrifice will know that he's God. 
All the people who could make it for this uh, uh, contest have showed up. The hillside is, is covered with people wanting to see the show. And so the prophets of Baal, they go first. And you have to feel kind of sorry for them because you know that they know they're fakes. They're just kind of going through the motions. But they're hooping and hollering and jumping and screaming and begging Baal to send fire. And there is no fire. They've worn themselves out. And Elijah said, all right, it's my turn. He said, but before I pray... I'm going to need some water. He said, can you all bring me four barrels of water? Mount Carmel is fairly close to the Mediterranean Sea, so they get the barrels of water and bring it, and he dumps it on the sacrifice. He said, give me four more. I won't do the sound effects. You get the idea. Eight barrels of water. He said, give me four more. Twelve barrels of water. There was so much water that the, the sacrifice is saturated. The wood is soaking wet. The water has run down. They made a little trench around it. Uh, he say, well, why in the world would he do that? What's the point? Well, if, if the wood wasn't completely wet and the sacrifice wasn't completely soaked, if there would have been a fire, somebody would have said, it's a trick. He had a match up his sleeve. I saw him with a lighter. But, but, but you get it soaking wet. If there's any kind of response, you know it's a miracle. And so in, in 1 Kings 18, Elijah bows his head and he says this. He said, God, would you let everybody know that you're God? And the Bible says the fire fell. It was such an intense fire that it burned the sacrifice and it burned the wood and it burned the rocks and it licked up the water that was in the trenches. And when the people out there saw what had happened, they fell on their face and they screamed out, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. God wants everybody to know that he's God. And he's looking for somebody whose heart is perfect that he might show them that he is God. Those unsaved people in your family, those folks that you're burdened about, that you've been praying for, God wants them to know that he's God. And he'd like to show them through you if your heart is perfect toward him. Those people in your neighborhood, those folks with whom you work, that one that's heavy on your heart, you're concerned about because they're so completely disinterested in the things of God. God wants to show himself strong and he's looking for somebody whose heart is perfect toward him. You read through the scriptures and you find person after person after person after person. Remember the story of the father, or, or Jairus, the, the soldier whose daughter was sick. Jesus said, I haven't found faith like this in all of Israel. His heart was perfect. And when that daughter raised from the dead, everybody in the household knew that it was God. You know, we live in some troublesome times. We, we, we live in a times of complete uncertainty, but can I remind you of a few things? God is still in charge. And God can do anything. He can do any. If he wants, he can make a pathway through the sea. If it would please God, he can send fire from heaven and burn up a soaking wet sacrifice. God can do anything. And he wants to do great things through you and through me. I was, I pastored in Missouri for 15 years and then the Lord led us into evangelism. And 
I was, I was concerned about going into evangelism. Uh, first of all, I, I didn't know what, what all that entailed. I just knew that that's what God wanted me to do. And so I, I told my wife, I said, I believe this is what God wants for us. And she said, I know, I've been thinking about it for a long time. So I, I resigned my church and we went into evangelism. Uh, somebody called and asked me for a meeting. I said, man, this is great. <laughs> this is wonderful. And so I went to preach a revival meeting in Wisconsin. And at the end of the week, God blessed. We saw some folks saved. We saw some decisions made. But at the end of the week, the pastor came, and he, he gave me my love offering. And he said, I wish it could be more. And I was thinking, ooh, I probably do too. <laughs> and that's when it first dawned on me that when I was a pastor, I got paid a salary. And I knew that every week I was going to have this much money coming in, and so we could set up a budget. And I, we didn't make a lot of money, but at least we knew what we had to live on. And, and it dawned on me that evangelism, you only get paid if somebody invites you to preach. And whatever they give you, that's what you get. And so I went in the church bathroom and opened the check. That's what all evangelists do. They go to the bathroom and <laughs> open the check. And the amount on the check didn't even cover our gasoline one way to go to the church. And I'm thinking, I know that they did what they could, and I don't feel like they should have done more, but the reality hit me. I have, I have a house, we have a mortgage, we have insurance, we have uh, the, the same responsibilities that other people have. Lord, how are we going to make this? What's going to happen? And I was, uh, uh, I don't want to say worried, because that's sinful, so I was just kind of anxious. No, I was worried. And so I went to the Bible, and I read this verse. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. And I thought, I think my heart's right with the Lord. I don't know of anything that would keep this from happening, so I guess we're going to be all right. Not very long afterwards, maybe five, ten minutes, my pastor called. And he said, hey, I got some good news for you. I said, okay. He said, a, a, a couple in the church just got some unexpected money, and they wanted to give you $1,000. So we deposited it in your bank account. I'm telling you what, I was that close to Pentecostal. <laughs> that close. I had just read that verse. I had just claimed that promise. And God instantaneously showed me that if we'll do right, he'll take care of us. God can do anything, and he wants to bless you. He wants to bless your family. He wants to bless your testimony. He wants to bless your bus route. He wants to bless those children that you work with. He wants to bless your soul-winning efforts. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. You know, God can do anything. You need a miracle financially? God can do that. You need a miracle physically? God can do that. You need a miracle in a situation with a loved one that you think is beyond repair? God can take care of that. God can do anything. He's looking to show himself strong through you and through me. So let me ask you two questions. Number one, would you like God to use you? 
to let other people know that he's God? Would you like God to use you? Number two, are you willing to get your heart perfect before him? Because that's what it takes. If you don't have the card, you don't get the money. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Let's stand, please, with our eyes closed. Before I pray, I want to ask you a couple of questions. In an audience this size, there are undoubtedly those who carry heavy burdens and you need for God to show himself strong. There are those who have prayer requests that are so personal you don't even share them with others. And you need God to show himself strong. With your eyes closed, I'm going to ask you those two questions again. Number one, how many of you would say, I want God to show himself strong through me? I know that he can, and I want that. If that's your desire, would you raise your hand and hold it up high? Thank you. You can put your hands down. That's the easy part. Here's the hard part. How many of you are willing to do what it takes? You're willing to get completely and thoroughly right with God. You're willing to make him your number one priority. You're willing to do what's necessary for your heart to be perfect toward him. How many tonight say, I want the blessings of God and I'm willing to do what it takes. Would you raise your hand? God bless you. I'm going to pray. If you need to get saved, you come tonight. That's the first step in a perfect heart. If you're not right with the Lord, you need to come and confess your sin before those of you who raised your hand and said, I want the blessings of God and I'm willing to do what it takes. This time is a time of dedication where you just simply say, Lord, I want people to know that you're God and I want, them to sh I want you to use me to show them. I'll pray and if God's spoken to your heart, you make your way to the altar. Father, thank you so much for the response tonight, so many that said, I want the blessings of God in my life. I want that problem, that situation, that person to know that you're God. So Lord, I pray for each one whose hand was raised tonight, given the courage and the strength and the character, the wisdom to do what's necessary. We'll thank you in Jesus' name, amen. You come quickly if God's spoken to you.